Now on BBC One, we cast our eyes into the starry skies with Patrick Moore, who sums up new findings relating to the outer giant planets Uranus and Neptune. Good evening. I've just received two magnificent pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope, and I thought you'd like to see them. This one is of a remote galaxy, ARP 220. And this is a starburst galaxy, inside which new stars are forming at a furious rate. And those bright patches are star clusters, much larger and brighter than any cluster in our own galaxy. And then look at this, the center of the famous spiral galaxy, M51, the whirlpool. And those two dark lanes may give a clue to the position inside the nucleus of a massive black hole. And I think you'll agree that these photographs show yet again that although the Hubble telescope hasn't got a perfect mirror, it is still very far from being a failure and is doing things that no Earth-based telescope can possibly do. You may remember that last month I said there was going to be an eclipse of the moon. Uh, and there was, it duly took place. You couldn't see it from here. I did see it. I was in Florida and Don Trombino took some pictures of it. Now, we thought this might be a dark eclipse because of volcanic ash thrown into the Earth's upper air by the eruption of Mount Pinotubo. And it certainly was. I've never seen anything like it. The dark part was completely invisible, the boundary was sharp, and there was no trace of colour. And had the moon been totally eclipsed, I'm quite sure it would have vanished completely. And it'll be very interesting indeed to see whether the next eclipse in December is equally dark. But now, on to my main theme. All the giant planets are on view now. Jupiter is in the southwest after dark. And here's a sketch I made of it a few nights ago with my 15-inch telescope. The great red spot is there. You can see it to the upper left, although it's not so prominent as it can sometimes be. Saturn is a morning object in Capricornus. We're going to have bright yellowish star. And although the rings are started to close, they're still wide open. But I want to turn now to the outer giants, Uranus and Neptune, which are together in the constellation of Sagittarius, the archer, not very far away from the third magnitude star, Pi Scorpii. And in the latest newsletter, I've given a chart which I think will help you to identify them. When I was over in Florida, Dr. Hutton of the Space Coast Observatory took a photograph which shows them both, and I think you'd like to see it. There it is, uh, there is Uranus, and there is Neptune. Now, Uranus at magnitude 5.7 is just on the fringe of naked eye visibility. Neptune at 7.9 is decidedly too faint. In binoculars, you can see them. They look like stars. With a telescope, the disk of Uranus is quite easy to see, but Neptune is considerably more difficult. And that's not surprising because both those planets are a long, long way away. Let's look now at a plan of the solar system. There we have the Sun in the middle, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and the asteroids, then Jupiter and Saturn, and then Uranus and Neptune. And in this diagram, the planets are put into their correct positions, and you can see that Neptune really is almost behind Uranus. But they are very spread out. And if you check, you will see that, in fact, Neptune is farther away from Uranus than we are from Saturn. And that's why they appear faint. They are, in fact, large. They are smaller than Jupiter and Saturn, but they certainly rank as giants. There's a segment of the sun at the bottom, and to scale the planets the small inner ones over to the right, and then the giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and finally Pluto. And in fact, Uranus and Neptune are also a great deal more massive than the Earth. Uranus weighs 14 times as much as the Earth does, and Neptune 17 times. They are almost twins, really, but in fact, Neptune is slightly the smaller, but also considerably the denser and the more massive. It's not surprising they weren't known in ancient times. Uranus was discovered in 1781, by our then unknown amateur astronomer, William Herschel, using a homemade six-inch telescope. And he recognized it as being not a star, because it showed a disk and it moved. Variations in Uranus's movement led two mathematicians, Adams in England and Leverrier in France, to calculate the position of another planet. They did so, and in 1846, upturned Neptune almost exactly where they had expected. And the solar system was then regarded as complete. Pluto didn't come along until 1930. Now, Uranus and Neptune are giants. They're gas giants, not a bit like the Earth. 
they have gaseous surfaces, although, although they are almost twins, they are not quite the same as the larger twins, Jupiter and Saturn. We believe that Jupiter and Saturn have very hot silicate cores, surrounded by layers of liquid hydrogen, above which come the hydrogen-rich cloud layers we can actually see. In the case of Uranus and Neptune, the situation is a bit different. They may have well-defined silicate cores, they may not, they may not be so differentiated as we say, and there's a great deal more ammonia, water and methane than there is in Jupiter and Saturn, although there too the outer clouds are very hydrogen rich. But there's one important difference. Jupiter, Saturn and Neptune all have strong sources of internal heat, and inside Jupiter the temperature may be 30,000 degrees at least. But Uranus apparently has almost no internal heat at all. And so in that respect, Uranus is very much of an odd one out. And there's another way, too, in which Uranus is decidedly strange. And that is in the tilt of its axis of rotation. I think most people know that as we go around the Sun, our axis is tilted to the perpendicular by 23 and a half degrees. And that's why we have our seasons. And most of the other planets are much the same but not Uranus. In the case of Uranus, the tilt is 98 degrees, more than a right angle, and that's very strange. Because Uranus is so far from the Sun, it has a long year. Remember, at the moment, Uranus is 1,720 million miles from us, and incidentally, Neptune, 2,880 million. So but although Uranus has this long year, has a rather quick day, only just over 17 hours long, and the axis of rotation has this extraordinary tilt. And the calendar there, well, each pole will have a midnight sun lasting for 21 Earth years with a corresponding period of darkness at the opposite pole. That's not the case with Neptune, where the tilt is 29 degrees, very much more like ours. So why does Uranus behave in that remarkable way? Frankly, we are not sure. There is one theory that in the very early days of the solar system, Uranus was literally struck by some massive, wandering body and knocked sideways. I'm not very happy about that particular idea, but on the other hand, I'm bound to say that I can't really think of anything better. And certainly that tilt of Uranus remains very much of a mystery at the present time. Because they're so far away, even though they're giants, round about 30,000 miles across, it's no wonder we can't see very much from Earth. I did have the chance a little while ago. I was over at the Palomar Observatory in California, where they have the 200-inch telescope. And I was able to use the 60-inch reflector there to have a look at Uranus and Neptune. And I couldn't see a great deal. There's my drawing of Uranus, a pale greenish disk. I thought I might see something on Neptune, which is more dynamic, but I didn't. Again, a pale bluish disk and no markings. Mind you, photographs taken with very large Earth-based telescopes have shown one or two cloudy features on Neptune, and those are about the best pictures taken, but not on Uranus. And that, I think, is linked with the fact that Neptune is a much more dynamic planet with a much greater store of internal heat. But almost everything we know in detail about Uranus and Neptune is derived from one space probe, Voyager 2, launched in 1977. And there am I, standing by a full-scale replica of it in the Jet Propulsion Laboratory over at Pasadena in California, and you can see it's not very large. By sheer good luck, at the end of the 1970s, the four giant planets were spread out in a kind of a curve, and it became possible to send the same space probe from one to the other in what I call interplanetary snooker. So two voyages went off, they both went past Jupiter, and then past Saturn. Voyager 1 then went out of the ecliptic, out of the solar system, but Voyager 2 went first past Uranus in 1986, and then past Neptune in 1989. We're still in touch with both these probes, but of course they will never come back. They're traveling too fast, and millions of years from now, they may still be traveling between the stars, unseen, unheard, and untrackable. But they've certainly done their job. So let's look first at Uranus. Voyager 2 sent back the first good pictures of the thin, narrow ring system. We knew it existed, but the rings of Uranus can't in any way be compared with the lovely system of Saturn. And bear in mind, too, that because of this remarkable axial inclination, as the probe went into Uranus, it went in more or less pole on. So in these pictures, the pole is in the centre of the disk and the equator round the edge. Not that that made a great deal of difference, because Uranus is such a bland kind of world, and only when Voyager was really close in did we see any clouds at all. There's nothing of the fine detail on the colours you see on Jupiter or Saturn, or even later on Neptune. 
But one very interesting thing did emerge. Uranus is a radio source. It does have a magnetic field, but the magnetic axis is inclined to the axis of rotation by nearly 60 degrees. And that is shown here. There we have the rotation axis, more than a right angle, and there is the magnetic axis, which doesn't even pass through the centre of the globe. And the polarity is opposite to ours, so that if you could go to Uranus and use your magnet magnetic compass, the needle would point south. That again is a total mystery. Uh, before the final pass of Neptune, we thought that that magnetic axis inclination might be due to the rotational axis, but um, we don't think so now, for reasons I'll come to in a few minutes. Meanwhile, leaving Uranus, on to Neptune in 1989. And even before Voyager got there, it became clear there was going to be a great deal more to see. And there, the lovely bluish disk. And the right in the middle there, you will see the famous great dark spot, a whirling storm in Neptune's atmosphere, just as big relative to Neptune as the great red spot is relative to Jupiter. And above the great dark spot, we see these strange clouds of methane cirrus, a really remarkable phenomenon, and there's nothing like that on Uranus. I may say also that below it, there is another spot, the triangular one. This is called the scooter, because it goes round very quickly. Neptune is the windiest planet in the entire solar system, and nearer the pole, where there's another dark spot, the rotation is slower still. But it is a very dynamic place, and the changes in the shape of the great dark spot are remarkably rapid. And in this series of time-lapse photographs, we've stabilised the position of the great dark spot to where you see what happens as Neptune spins. You see the changes in shape, and they're very marked indeed, much more so than the changes in shape of the great red spot on Jupiter. Elsewhere on Neptune, we have clouds, and they cast shadows onto the cloud deck far below. You can see them there. Again, nothing like that in the solar system. But the magnetic axis, that was a surprise. We didn't think they're going to have an inclined axis, but we did. Just as with Uranus, the magnetic axis is inclined to the axis of rotation, this time by nearly 50 degrees. And that wasn't expected, because it did indicate that the Uranus and Neptune are magnetically very alike. And we thought that the strange tilt of Uranus was responsible for their magnetic axis there. That seems not to be so. And again, frankly, we are at the moment completely puzzled by that. Neptune, too, has rings. They've been suspected from Earth, not confirmed. There they are, as shown by Voyager 2. That black strip, of course, is merely an area not covered by the photograph, otherwise the ring system would have been drowned. So much for the giants themselves. What now about their families of moons? Before Voyager, we'd known that Uranus had five moons, Miranda, Ariel, Umbriel, Titania, and Oberon. Voyager actually found another ten all closer in. But all the formerly named moons were imaged by Voyager. There is Oberon, smaller than our moon, icy and cratered. There is Titania, also icy and cratered. Umbriel, smaller still, with a dark, subdued surface, and a strange, bright thing near the top called Vunda. We're not sure what that is. Ariel, again fairly small, with strange, branching valleys. And then Miranda, a small, very varied world, with strange enclosures, mountains and craters, and cliffs of ice. Look at those amazing ice cliffs there. They're 12 miles high. And using the Voyager images and using computer simulations, we can now take you for a ride over Miranda. And there we have the, the valleys, the craters, and presently we'll come to the ice cliffs themselves, which, as I say, are 12 miles high. There is a theory that in its history, Miranda has been broken up and reformed several times. Again, I find that rather hard to credit, but it certainly is by no means impossible. So that's the system of Uranus. The satellite system of Neptune is different again. Before Voyager, two attendants were known. They were Triton and Nereid, and each was very strange in its own way. I must say the six more have been discovered now. They're all pretty small. Of the two previously known satellites, Triton was thought to be rather larger than our moon. Actually, it's not. It's slightly smaller. We didn't know that. It goes around Neptune in a circular orbit, but in a retrograde or wrong way direction, a direction opposite to that in which Neptune spins. And it's the only large planetary satellite to behave in that way. The other satellite, Nereid, is much smaller, has a strange elliptical orbit, more like that of a comet than a satellite. And by sheer bad luck, when Voyager 2 went into Neptune, Nereid was in the wrong part of its path, and only one very bad picture was obtained, so, frankly, we don't know much about Nereid even now. But Triton was the real shock. 
And as Voyager went in, it was seen that the south pole of the satellite is covered with snow. Not ordinary snow, but pink nitrogen snow. Remember, Triton is intensely cold. Only a few tens of degrees above absolute zero. The chilliest world ever to have been encountered by a spacecraft. So nitrogen literally freezes out. And there's detail there. And further away from the pole, there's a different kind of terrain. Then there's cantaloupe terrain, which looks rather like the skin of a melon. And then, what about the atmosphere? We thought that there might be quite a dense atmosphere. In point of fact, there isn't. There is a trace of atmosphere, and it's made out chiefly of nitrogen. You can just see it there, showing up as a haze above the satellite's rim. But it is very tenuous indeed. So, let's now go for one of our flybys over Triton, starting this time at one of the icy lakes in the Cantaloupe area. And probably there's water ice below, and different kinds of ices, nitrogen ice and methane ice on top. But notice from that that there's almost no surface relief on Triton. It's a very smooth kind of world. There are no mountains, no deep valleys, and very few craters. But the real surprise came in the geysers. Now here again is part of the pink snow cap at the South Pole. And there in the middle you'll see a bright speck and a dark plume. And that dark plume does in fact mark an active geyser. The material coming out from inside Triton. And uh, we believe the cause is due to a layer of liquid nitrogen well below the icy crust. And it's kept liquid because of the pressure above. But if that liquid nitrogen starts to migrate toward the surface, through a weak point on the crust, then the pressure is relaxed and it explodes in a shower of nitrogen ice and snow. And the debris is then blown downwind in the very thin Tritonian atmosphere, and that produces the dark plume you can see there. And there were several of those. And I may say, this was a tremendous shock. No one had expected any kind of activity on a world like Triton, and geysers had certainly not been expected there. No doubt, they've been going off for millions of years, and will go on going off for millions of years to come. But uh, we're going to find it hard to obtain proof. You certainly won't be able to observe them from Earth, and uh, no further probes to Neptune and Triton are funded as yet. Meanwhile, as Voyager 2 drew away, it sent back one lovely last picture showing Neptune and Triton together. When we're going to learn any more? Frankly, I do not know. But one day, I hope we will. Meanwhile, we've learned a great deal from Voyager 2. But um, I think it's rather interesting to go on one more imaginary trip. So let's imagine we've joined our next spacecraft and we're going out to these remote regions. And there we are, bypassing first of all Uranus, and there in the foreground is the strange crater satellite Miranda. Now let's go to Neptune. And here's a view of Neptune from one of the six inner satellites discovered by Voyager 2. And finally, the pièce résistance onto the surface of Triton, with Neptune looming large in the Tritonian sky, and the geysers sending their material high above the surface. It'll be a wonderful sight. Whether anyone is going to see it ever, I do not know. But meanwhile, I think we'd agree that unfriendly and remote and difficult to study that they are, these two outer giants have got points of very great interest, and one day we may learn more about them. Before I go, I did mention that um, in our newsletter, I've given a chart of the positions of Uranus and Neptune to help you find them. If you want the newsletter, then as usual, send your stamp to this envelope to newsletter number 46, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London W 7 RJ. And if you want the latest news, then simply dial our information line, 0898 When I come back next month, I'll be able to tell you the results of the encounter between the Giotto space probe and comet Griggs-Shellerup. And that should be very interesting indeed. So until then, good night. <laughs>